Sonraki konuşmacımız hyaluronik dans hakkında her şey hyaluronik, hyaluronik asit enjeksiyonlar için olmazsa olmaz. Patrick Tracy, please. Thank you very much for inviting me to Istanbul. And I'm going to give two lectures um, back to back. Uh, one of them is on a compound that we use every day, which is hyaluronidase, and I suppose my role in its introduction to aesthetic medicine. And my second lecture will be on where we are with reversing dermal filler blindness. So, have I just right do this now, first? We are searching these tide pools off the coast of Eastern Australia for the most toxic fish on the planet. The stonefish is notorious for having the most painful sting in all of nature. And today, I'm going to get stung by a stonefish. But first, we've got to find one. Let's get looking. It's going to be very hard to find the stonefish because in addition to their legendary... Wow, there it is. That is the stonefish. Look at that tide pool monster. I can't believe we found one. I mean, it looks like a living rock. I never would have spotted this. So, hyaluronidase and its role in aesthetic medicine comes from the stonefish. And particularly, the genetic sequence was worked out. Now, we get our hyaluronidase from sheep's testicles or different sources. And the Americans use the genetic form, which is much smaller, and that comes from stonefish. So where did it all start? The history of hyaluronidase, a lot of people put to Karl Mayer, who was a German scientist, Jewish, who left during the Nazi occupation, but it didn't start there. It actually started with Felix Duran Reynolds, and this is the Rockefeller Institute in New York back then. So in 1928, Felix had discovered from strep pneumonia, and don't forget the strep pneumonia was not too long discovered. It was after Pasteur, it was after the um, microscope was discovered, we were able to see bacteria for almost the first time. And he noted that when he was using strep pneumonia extracts with rabbit skin, because they were starting to make vaccines in that period also, that this had a spreading factor. And the spreading factor was that if you add hyaluronidase to any chemical, it spreads further in the body. And that's probably common sense, because it's breaking down the hyaluronic acid in the cells so that the hyaluronidase will spread more. And this is important if you're using Botox. If you want Botox to work better, add in hyaluronidase particularly if you're doing something like hyperhidrosis, where you want it to spread away from your injection points. It's very easy to do, and it makes Botox work much better. So again, at this stage, he discovered that his spreading factor was also present in testicles. Now, this isn't unusual, because if you want the sperm to penetrate an ova, the sensiblest thing to do is add hyaluronidase because it'll break down the wall of the ova and penetrate better. If you want an insect to kill somebody, what you do is you add hyaluronidase because then the venom spreads around the body and you're dead within a minute or two. So all the forms of hyaluronidase either came from snakes, bees, stonefish, testicles, that's where they all came from. So. We now know also, for instance, that we can get our hyaluronidase from bees and snake venom, which is the reason that we often ask somebody before we inject it, are you allergic to bee stings? So you can see the logic. And the next was in 1939, Ernst Chien and McClellan had discovered that it came from bees and that. Interesting thing was that Reynolds' brother was also involved in the studies after 1929, between 1931 and 1933, in terms of snake venom. So, Karl Meyer comes into the picture because he 
is very important to us. He was a doctor, Jewish, just before the Second World War, who had to flee Germany because of Nazism. So he went to Boston and eventually to California. But the interesting thing was that he discovered hyaluronic acid. So we know that hyaluronic acid is present in our knee joints, is present in our eyeballs, and we inject it into people. But at the time, he worked in ophthalmology, became an ophthalmic surgeon, and he worked in um, Chicago, Boston, California, discovering hyaluronic acid. And the reason I mention him is that after he discovered this, his friends were Ernest Krebs and Ernest Chain, who had discovered big things in biochemistry, and he felt that he had wasted his life, believe it or not. He felt that he was as intelligent, as important as these people, but they had discovered hemoglobin, they discovered structures like that, and he had spent his whole life discovering hyaluronic acid. And even when he got his award, he turned around and he said in 1958, in my opinion, mucopolysaccharides will never be a popular field in biochemistry. They will probably be relegated to insignificance and disregarded. Little did he know that the whole of aesthetic medicine would come from injecting hyaluronic acid. And later in 1967, when he was being awarded by the National Academy of Sciences, he said, looking back on my scientific career, I often wondered whether it was worthwhile to stick so tenaciously to a technically different um, un and unexciting field. So where do I come into the equation? Um, I've mentioned originally what hyaluronic acid does, and um, I suppose if I spin through these, that's the paper that Stonefish was used to get the genetic sequence of hyaluronides. That's the timeline um, between Karnmeier discovering um, hyaluronic acid, the different forms of hyaluronic acid and hyaluronides. Now, I come into it back when 1996, believe it or not, the hyaluronic acids became popular in aesthetic medicine. Now, we have a young generation of doctors here that forget that these things had to be discovered, and the problems that created had to be discovered also. And when I started off in aesthetic medicine, we didn't know how to reverse Botox problems. If somebody got a ptosis, somebody had to work out to reverse that. Now, we have had problems with fillers since the 1950s. My second lecture is on blindness, but don't forget, we were getting blindness from derma fillers from fat injections back in the 1950s. There's nothing new about this. One of our big problems, I shouldn't say problems, one of our reasons that things took so long was in America they were using collagen, and they wouldn't change over to hyaluronic acid. So for the first years, between 1999 and 2005, we had all the Americans coming to Dublin and to London to get treatment with hyaluronic acid. The hyaluronic acid fillers originally just lasted six months, but collagen only lasted three months. And collagen came from animals and could cause anaphylaxis. People tend to forget that now because collagen is in the past. But I had written to QMED at the time and said, we need an antidote to hyaluronic acid. And they said, no, we don't. We don't have any problems. It's good pro product. I said, we're going to have problems. And that was an email that I don't want to share because it, it sort of identifies somebody saying, we'll not have any problems with it. So in the FACE conference in 2004, I had turned around and said, we need to use highly run it is because we're going to have certain problems, but at the rate of 1,500. When Michael Jackson had a problem in the United States, they had to send him to Ireland to get the filler taken out of his face because nobody had any experience in the United States with highly run it is, at least in that period. That's 2005, 2006. So in 2007, 
I sort of turned around and said, okay, even if we're using it off-label, we have to start using hyaluronidase because we're going to have people that are going to go blind. It's going to happen. And even then, with arterial embolus, I had said, hyaluronic acid caught within an artery. If you get that, don't be afraid to inject hyalase. Inject, inject, inject. Everybody says to only use 30 or 50 units. I don't agree. Put in 300 to 500 units. You're going to cause no problem. You're trying to save a patient's face. You're going to try and save their sort of sight. Now, the thing is, we... So everybody remembers Claudio Lorenzo's paper in 2017. That was 10 years before it. I was saying use 1,500 units. And as predicted, the very next year, we had our first case of blindness in London. And that's when I was president of the Royal Society Aesthetics. And a colleague of ours, Lucy Glancy, had a patient who was blind. That was from Sculptra. And um, then I started writing papers in terms of how to reverse vascular occlusions. And I had said also at that time, do not use the retrobulbar method. It makes no anatomical sense. It will not work. And I had, my next lecture is on reversing dermophilar blindness, so I'll not spend too long at that. At that meeting in Los Angeles or Las Vegas in 2014, myself, Claudio Lorenzo, Stephen Diane, Corey Mass had said we need to increase the units. The reason was, in the United States, they were using little 50-unit hyalinex, which is genetic. We were using 1,500 units. So we were using, our units were 30 times bigger. So when I was saying to them, listen, you've got to start using 500 at least if you want to reverse a vascular occlusion, what I really was saying to them, you need 10 of your things just to start. So that's why it took long. In Moscow in 2015, they had called my protocol the Tracy Protocol. That was in Georgia the year afterwards. The Russian media came to interview me, and I got some awards for introduction of the higher protocols at the time. That's some of the papers that I'd written on it. That's an article that the Los Angeles Times did on me for introducing hyaluronidase to aesthetic medicine. And now, everybody does that worldwide. So, I, that's good timing, I think, for that lecture. So, that's for hyaluronidase. And my next lecture will be on where we are with reversing dermal filler blindness. Has anybody any questions? Or? All good.